Welcome to the Marketing Society Sustainability Squad podcast, leading the conversation on ESG. So today I'm joined by Vikram Krishna. Vikram is the co-founder of Sacred Groves, a community interest company that protects forests and natural habitats from destruction all over the world. He's had a 28-year corporate career with Emirates MBD and in financial services, uh, delivering award-winning marketing campaigns, transforming customer experience and brand projects. Being a long-distance runner, as you've told me, Vikram, uh, you're all set for the long haul in protecting natural habitats. Welcome, Vikram. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me over. The long-distance runner hurts a bit right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Summer's in. <laughs> how many kilometers did you do yesterday? <laughs> well, don't even ask. <laughs> this was not meant to be an embarrassing podcast. <laughs> well, I have to congratulate you for your work in your invitation and work in Cannes, being recognized for the work you're doing with Sacred Groves. So how was your journey there? Oh, it was fantastic. So um, we were invited by the International Advertising Association and they're an 85-year-old organization that brings in marketeers and advertisers from all over the world. Um, essentially, a community of marketeers who are trying to push the boundaries and, and so on. So, we become their global strategic partner for conservation. And uh, my agenda really is to nudge marketeers a little bit uh, in terms of adding uh, conservation uh, into their campaign and marketing agenda. And seeing how best we can drive that conversation forward. Another acronym to add to our our toolbook. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> we never short of acronyms, right? <laughs> As an industry. Um, so tell us a little bit more about Sacred Groves. How did it come about? Yeah, so Sacred Groves is something that Monisha and I, my co-founder and a friend of ours, Sudhir, uh, we set this up uh, three years back, although we had been discussing it for the past seven years. And uh, it culminated out of my journey uh, over the past 28 years with, well, Emirates NBD, City, HSBC, and other banks. Uh, so I think my turning point was um, after a career in, in marketing and, and custom experience and analytics, I got corporate responsibility added to my profile. <laughs> so that was the learning point. And I must say, I, I very reluctantly stepped into that role, saying that, what have I got to do with you know, corporate responsibility? But then that's what happens when you, you know, by providence, you come across those moments in life. So I think that changed me and that changed Monisha. Um, and we started doing a lot in our personal life. We started recycling and composting. We do solar cooking. Yeah? We drive those EVs and so on. <laughs> uh, but uh, when you're on this path, you realize that the more you do, uh, the more you feel, the less it is. Yeah. So... Um, we visited uh, sacred forests in one of our trips. So we travel a lot, sustainable as we can make it out to be. <laughs> but we visited the sacred forest. and um, This is the one in northern India, right? It's in northern India in a place called Meghalaya. Yeah. It was um, probably, it's prob it's probably the wettest part of the planet. Uh, and we went during the monsoons. Um, and we were guided into this forest by a local tribal. And the reverence that he had for that forest is really what sort of sparked our, you know, soul. Yeah. And that's when we decided that this is what we would like to do, which is to bring about a stronger connection uh, between humans and nature. And we also realize ourselves that as urban folks, we'd lost that connection because the nearest forest <laughs> is far away. Yeah? So that's where Sacred Groves was born as a brand. And uh, we were... Um, pretty moved by a horrific statistic that every six seconds, a soccer field equivalent of forests is lost. Yeah. So in 20 minutes, you can do the mathematics. Yeah. It's just unbelievable. And it's not stopping. So um, that's when Monisha and I and they said that, look, um, this is an area that deeply concerns us. We are passionate about it. And we need to do whatever we can, you know, to support this. So, <laughs> we decided to buy our own forests. <laughs> <laughs> How does one buy their own forest? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, when we said about trying to buy our own forest, we realized how difficult it is. Yeah. And uh, when we realized the level of difficulty, uh, that really piqued our interest even more. Yeah. 
So we said that it's going to take us this kind of time to buy a forest and then why can't we create uh, an avenue or a mechanism where whoever wants to, you know, participate in conservation, that whole process can become much easier. Yeah. So we um, bought our first forest in the UK, uh, in Wales. Um, and as we did that, a lot of the community that we are a part of started recognizing this and saying, you, you're buying a forest? I mean... <laughs> Why? What are you going to do with it? It's nothing. <laughs> and, um, you know, people got interested and they said that, look, we understand why you want to do this, which is to let nature be. Yeah. And is there a way that we can get involved as well? So that's when uh, Sacred Grows as a company got formed. And then we created a mechanism that allows people and companies to seamlessly participate in conservation. I want to pick up on two very very interesting points one was when you went to the sacred forest yeah um I picked up on a really interesting point where he said to you that the, the the tour guide from the tribe told you don't take anything in don't take anything out can you yeah. reflect on that moment for you yeah so i think that was like a goosebump kind of a moment yeah. and uh, i must say that everybody else i'm not used to it so wherever we go we pick up a little piece of that and bring it along, right? Yep. So when he said that and the way he said it, and um, sometimes the eyes speak more than words. And the way he said it to us really was the turning point. And that's when we realized that if you let nature be, uh, then it really takes us to a better place. And sometimes, you know, we as humans are um, a little arrogant where we want to get involved mm -hmm. uh, in nature and we believe that we can make it better yeah um, and that was the other thing that sort of guided us which is that when you let nature be then forests flourish biodiversity uh, flourishes too and um, I think yeah. this week itself you you referenced this point um, with your your interviews out in Cairns where where they mention where you mentioned I think um, that we're the only species that wastes oh ever. my god yeah Okay, so you, are you ready for some uh, difficult, uh, uh, inconvenient truths? Let's go for it. Yeah, so so we are the only species that waste. There are estimates ranging from 6 to 10 million species that the planet has. Yeah, mm, The waste of one species is the food for the other, but not for us. Now, with that, what has it resulted into? Yeah, So there's a very interesting study that was done by um, the Institute of Science at Wiseman um, in Israel. Uh, they, uh, you know, put a definition to the fact that we are in, a, in the Anthropocene age, which means that human influence on planetary systems is inordinate. So the, the question was, can you put a number to it? So the answer they came up with is that the estimated weight of all human stuff which is this lovely studio building, roads, infrastructure, you know, yeah. is about 1,100 gigatons. And the weight of nature, which is those beautiful plants behind you, yeah. uh, animals and fishes in the ocean, is 900 gigatons. So there's already a 200 gigaton gap uh, between us and nature. Yeah? You being a banker, <laughs> uh, and I being an ex-banker, um, if you forward this to the next 10 years, yeah, uh, we need to keep in mind the fact that uh, the world economy runs on this metric of GDP growth. Yeah? Yeah. So, so we believe that if you're doing well, it is the fact that the GDP is growing. Yeah? But when you deconstruct this GDP growth, yeah. Yeah, it is 1,100 tons becoming bigger and bigger. Yeah. So if you look at, say, one and a half to two percent GDP growth year on year over the next 10 years, do the math and see where it's going to be. We're yeah. in the negative Joe space, basically, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what we're saying. Right? Exactly. And, and, and more, more to your point, when you look at 900 gigatons, which is the weight of nature, 55 percent of the world's GDP extracts from nature. So again, extrapolated to the next 10 years, uh, probably we'd be 2x of nature. Yeah. Mm, what does that do? It creates unprecedented challenges. So um, this, for example, uh, you know, is going to be the hottest summer 
that we've experienced ever in human history. And the next five years are going to get even worse because we enter into what is called the El Nino effect. Yeah. So it is challenging. We are wasting more than we need to. And um, I think um, time has come for a bit of a reset. Big time. <laughs> and actually, you talked about the hottest summer. Yeah. Uh, and I've referenced this in one of the previous podcasts, but it, I, I picked up on you talking about what happened in Wales. So I want you to reflect on this was last summer in the UK was the hottest summer on record ever. My son was actually born, my third son, oh. he was born on that day. So Ooh. I took a screen grab of this very interesting BBC chart. And I said to him, I was in the hospital when I saw this article. My God. Uh, and I was like, I need to do something about this. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully this will be one of the first steps I've taken. But you also showed us, back coming back to nature, how nature dealt with it in Wales, where actually what you're protecting, the the the, the forest you're protecting in Wales, actually reported cooler temperatures than the surrounding areas because nature helped itself. Yeah, absolutely. So we, uh, you know, the forest that we protect, we have a uh, almost a, uh, a near real-time monitoring program where you use, use satellite imagery to see exactly how the forest is and then we also do frequent visitation uh, through professionals uh, so this was us as founders going to see our forest last year in the middle of summer uh, so we booked a hotel and and uh, in Wales and um, they were at least four to six degrees cooler uh -huh. um, the bed of moss was moist and uh, you know these are 150 200 year old uh, secondary forest so they have a very healthy upper story mid story and, and a ground cover yeah. so yes this forest knew how to take care of itself however uh, the previous year on the same time there was a little stream of water flowing through our uh, area that stream I did not see yeah wow <laughs> <laughs> so that tells you the that impact you. Yeah, that you've yeah. seen in one year yes and you've had this forest for how many years I mean, we 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 bought, we got this three years back. Uh, this was our first forest. Yeah, and uh, we are we are hoping that over the over the course of the next um, seven to eight years, we land up with about a million acres of such forests that are protected yeah. forever. Um, you know, with your great experience in marketing, and many people when they talk about ESG or CSR and taking on those hats now, uh, feel like could. ESG, CSR, or technology as it has been in recent years, hinder creativity. Quite the contrary from what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, when you look at um, um, marketing, it's all about differentiation. When you look at creativity, it's all about solving big problems. What can be a bigger problem than this? Very well said. Very yeah. well said. What can be a bigger problem? Yeah. So, um, we need to also look at ourselves in the context of a few factors. I think first is uh, capital flows. So global capital flows are clearly turning um, towards um, avenues that are friendlier towards the environment and um, assist the climate transition, which is necessary. Second, uh, regulatory influences. So all marketing heads today make your GRI reports and your sustainability reports. Um, they all read uh, by rating agencies, uh, investors, uh, regulators. So they no longer... Uh, nice documents that you put on a shelf anymore. <laughs> They're actually being read. Yeah. And third is consumers are demanding it. Yeah. So now enough and more studies have been done globally across many sectors where consumers are clearly saying that we expect that the organization that we're buying our products from has uh, an agenda which is more sort of uh, friendlier yeah. towards the community, uh, towards the environment and has the best interests of everybody at heart. So we don't really have a choice of the matter. Yeah. Yeah. And I believe very strongly that organizations that will differentiate themselves uh, would be able to have a, you know, a unique point of view in terms of how they're addressing this. And I saw that recently in, the, in this past week at uh, Khan as well. Yeah. That organizations that were uh, developing a unique voice, but mindful of the fact it's a genuine voice. Yeah. It's an authentic voice. Not they really one. mean what they say. Yeah. yeah? Um, and I think the note of caution there is that consumers and regulators are sniffing that out quite easily. So uh, as you, as a marketer, when you embark into this area, just make sure that you back all your action up with real facts. And mean it impact. and do it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
I think it's not just meaning it and doing it, but also reporting back on it properly. Mm. If you're keeping transparent, one of our previous guests actually talked about this, is giving that insight back to the market. And But looking ahead to this year, um, and people talking about you know COP commitments, I feel many brands are quite nervous of making commitments. But you have to take that first step. You took this step. Um, what would your advice be to those people who are scared of saying they're going to do something and then they don't know if they're going to tread that in a, in a, in a, in the way they want to? But it's not about not doing something because we've gone past that point, as you've rightly told us. We've gone past the point. It, now is the time for action and this COP is going to be the COP of action, right? Yeah, so, you know, many a times when people are faced with a big problem, um, they put themselves into a corner of uh, inaction. And that was being beautifully expressed in a book called The Nudge Theory by uh, Dr. Richard Thaler. And he also got the uh, Nobel Prize for it. I, I think the point to refer to the Nudge Theory here in context is uh, a very simple example of uh, since you have a, you have little babies, right? Yeah. So how do you get a baby to have an apple? You have two choices. Either give the apple to the baby or cut it up into small pieces and chunks and make them look attractive yeah. and place it. The chances are, obviously, that when you cut it up into little chunks and make that available to the child, the child will consume it. Because the human brain is more accepting of smaller incremental decisions than those big decisions, yeah. which probably you know put ourselves into a bit of a coma. So that's my sort of feedback to all marketeers, which is that there is no one big thing here when it comes to climate action. Yeah, uh, There are hundreds of interventions that we all need to do in our personal lives as well as in the organizations that we represent. Yeah. Yeah. If we wait for that one big action, uh, then it's an issue. So my message is, you know, integrate this into your culture. Um, make it like a combination of many, many small steps. Yeah? Because it's these small steps which are done consistently with genuine intentions, uh, they can make a difference. So, I want to go back into community interest company. This is a, a new coin term, I would say, no? <laughs> um, could you elaborate on that for us a little bit? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I, I've been in the private sector for the past 28 years, and I also had the opportunity to be on the board of a few NGOs as well. Yeah? And I come from a family of civil servants. <laughs> so, you can actually see right now three sectors that I've already been a part of. Yeah? Uh, I always believe that each of these sectors has their own strengths. Yeah. So, capitalism is incredibly efficient in, in driving uh, you know, resources towards certain outcomes. Uh, government sector does a great job in terms of welfare of the society. Uh, the NGOs are more sort of oriented towards you know, doing good for the community in more ways than one. Yeah. But I wasn't entirely sure that when you look at climate action, um, which sector I want to be a part of. It's yeah. a very interesting perspective, right? Yeah. Because, so yeah. We, uh, we didn't coin this, but yeah. I'm going to tell you now. Yeah. Uh, so we, we belong to what is called the fourth sector, yeah. which is for benefit enterprises. Yeah. So for benefit enterprises, as the, as the term suggests, exist for the benefit of all stakeholders, which is employees, communities, shareholders, and so on. Triple bottom line. It's the triple bottom line. Yeah. Uh, and the reason why we chose the CIC structure out of the UK is because um, we wanted our forest to remain forest forever. And the CIC has something called an asset lock. So the moment we purchase a forest uh, as a company and we declare that as a conservation asset, we cannot ever change the end use of that asset uh, for the life of the company. And we have to declare that every year in the form of a community interest. Yeah. So, uh, CICs um, are growing. B Corp in the US yeah. is, is growing as well. There are a lot of companies that are actually joining up uh, to become B Corp. Actually, we're going to be getting a B Corp speaker later on in the year. Oh, hopefully. you are? So, yeah, that's ah. quite interesting. You mentioned them. Yes, yes. So, so I think uh, B Corps exist for the benefit of everyone. Yeah. And they try to strike a balance. Yeah. Which is what I hope and aspiration is. We may sound a little idealistic at the moment, but I firmly believe that Fast forward this to a few years, this will become the norm. Standard in the industry. So, how do you go, I, you've referenced this a couple of times, but I want to ask it more specifically. 
financial service is a very, I would say, difficult category, right? It's probably when you're a marketeer, FMCG is attractive, you know, uh, tech is attractive. Us guys in the financial <laughs> services marketing, right? We've got a hard product to sell because we're selling money effectively. Yeah. And for you to actually go two questions loaded into one, I would say, is you're going from financial services background a long time in it as well. Most of us, when we stay in there, we stay in there, we get coined a banker. And, uh, <laughs> we talked about our stripy shirts, which was not scripted <laughs> by any means. Um, Bankers but, and pinstripes. <laughs> <laughs> but to do something very out of the category. And I mean, many people may come back at me and say, this should be part of the category. So that's a different question coming. But, you know, you connected a passion and interest and a motivation together. And I really like that part of, you look, when we spoke first time, when we heard about Sacred Groves, you can feel the passion oozing out of it. How how did you land here, I would say? Yeah, so, um, yes, I admit it was an unusual choice because you don't really have bankers turning into conservationists. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it wasn't an unusual choice for me personally uh, because I've always been uh, driven by purpose. I've always been um, extremely passionate about what I do. So... I mean, I had the privilege of leading marketing at uh, at Emirates NBD, where I launched the brand, which is now a $4 billion brand. So, um, for me, it wasn't really uh, anything out of the ordinary. So, those who know me well uh, didn't blink an eye when, when, I, when I started communicating to them about the decision I'm about to take. Mm-hmm. Um, but so my message to uh, marketers in this is that you know, our industry is a very head and a heart industry. But it starts with the heart. Yeah. Yeah. If you have the heart in place and you're convinced about what you want to do, just do it. Yeah. Yeah. And then you let your head take over to see what framework would you like to set? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What would you like to influence? How would you like to go about it? Yeah. When is the right time? Mm-hmm. Yeah. To take that action. Yeah. And just follow it through. So, you know, banking is all about, and you would agree with me, it's about doing, uh, you know, things every day correctly and making sure that you scale that up uh, so that millions of lives get impacted positively. Uh, this is no different. Yeah? So banking taught me trust, yeah. which is what we represented as marketers and, uh, and uh, banking professionals because people have trusted their money yeah. uh, with us. So here, what we're just trying to do is to say that, look, uh, climate action requires a whole new approach. Uh, it requires scale. It requires a certain set of confidence which technology can bring in with transparency. Uh, it also requires some level of trust which uh, regulations and compliance help yeah. uh, in establishing. And um, You couldn't yeah. let compliance and legal and all of that. You couldn't leave it behind no, you. No, <laughs> never. <laughs> you can't take that out of us, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we uh, we are we are uh, uh, we we follow uh, international law uh, in all our documents. Uh, we are fully audited. Um, Monisha is pretty much like our chief compliance officer, <laughs> uh, and we have a board where the regulations are advisory board where yeah. you know that that guides us in key decision making. So a lot of that uh, got integrated into what I was trying to do. But coming back, it, it is not anything different from what I've done in the past. So there's a lot you've taken from it into this new journey. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, anyone who's making a career transition uh, would recognize and should recognize the fact that whatever you've done in the past has made you who you are today. Very, very true. Which will make you successful tomorrow yep. or which will also make you fail tomorrow. <laughs> yeah? So true. it's important to just recognize that uh, and build on what you have. You mentioned tech and, you know, we all talk about the disruption it brought to our industry specifically, yeah. but also how this has helped you in enabling what you're doing. So you're using blockchain technology to create digital twins and selling it. Could you re- tell us a yeah, little yeah. bit about Yeah, so, so essentially, uh, you know, what, we, um, what we're doing, I mean, banking, if you look at it, is essentially a tech play now. Yeah, so uh, for the regular customer, the mobile app is pretty much the mainstay when it comes to banking interactions. And there are, from the last I read, there were almost 15 billion mobile phone connections. So so tech has this unique ability to connect people. Um, 
Also, what I realize is that when we set up our company, which is a community interest company that's protecting forests in different parts of the world, there are a few principles that are super important to us. Yeah? The first one was the principle of transparency. So when I was a, when I was a part of my, when I wear my NGO hat, yeah? now, more often than not, I found that uh, transparency seemed to be a bit missing. Um, you know, reporting would be a bit of an issue. You would trust people, which is not a problem. We yeah. One should trust. Uh, but it's just that when it comes to reportage uh, in banking and financial services, then it has to be fact-based. Yeah. Yeah? So we wanted to make sure, number one, it is uh, transparent. Uh, second is we wanted scalability because we want, uh, like you have nature behind you, we want nature in people's drawing rooms. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how do you do that? So technology has this unique ability to connect uh, people. Uh, and last but not the least, uh, we used this whole aspect of tokenization uh, because we wanted to democratize the participation and conservation. So what we do is that we, when we purchase these forests, uh, we create a digital twin, uh, a base level digital twin using uh, geospatial imaging, and then we tokenize that. Yeah. Uh, and each of these tokens are then are put on the blockchain for transparency and traceability perspective. And these tokens have a validity of 10 years. Yeah. Um, each token is like a Lego brick. So pretty much the size of this room. Um, and you can purchase one or tens of thousands depending on the appetite that the person or the company has. So this is basically saying you take an image of the forest. Yes. Um, and put that online for people to be able to see which forest in yes. which location they want to buy yes and it's not just the whole you're not going to end up buying the whole forest that's your <laughs> job our job is to or, or consumer who wants to come in and, and there's gifting part of it there's corporate gifting which i'll come on to in a second but you can effectively go and own a part of that forest and you know exactly where it is you can go visit yeah. it you yeah. can and, and and you'll be able to track it yes yes absolutely so you'll be able to participate in the preservation and protection of nature yeah you'll be able to do that seamlessly um, each token costs fifty dollars. Yeah. So then, you know, like you can replace that with uh, these sacred grove clusters. Yeah. And they have been gifted as well. There are forty-six different gifting occasions that individuals can choose from. Yeah. And companies are using us as a part of their um, consumer strategy. Yeah. So there are various ways that that is happening. I think one that I wanted to highlight from a marketing perspective is making conservation a core benefit in your value proposition. So if there are uh, seven reasons to wear this wonderful pinstripe shirt that <laughs> both of us are wearing, <laughs> then make conservation the eighth benefit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the moment you make that an eighth benefit, then what happens is that you're still able to uh, pursue your commercial agenda, which is super important for organizations. Yeah. yeah? Uh, second is you're able to attract a slightly wider demographic, uh, which is actually quite clear about the fact that you know, we would want to see you making a positive contribution to, to the community and the environment around us. Third is you make sure that you don't raise the price point beyond what the customers can afford and pay for. So that's something that consumers across the world are telling us very clearly. That, mm -hmm. hey, companies, do what you're supposed to do. Do it well, do it right. Don't charge us Don't more. charge me more for it. It is your fiduciary duty. It's like hygiene. Yeah. yeah? So conservation commerce enables organizations to do it. So the first company that came on board was a very interesting one. It's a... Uh, Instagram based uh, art seller. Yeah. Yeah. So they have, I mean, there are other platforms as well, but that's really where they sell most. So it's called PR Nation. And uh, now for every square feet of art they sell, they protect a square feet of forest with sacred groves. Fantastic. Yeah. So then consumers can see a very clear benefit that, okay, I like this art. It fits into my scheme of things. I like the price point. Um, it's also probably sustainably sourced. But also each time I buy it, a piece of nature is getting protected as well. Yeah. So the reason I'm saying this in this podcast is yeah. that this is just an example for marketers to think about their value proposition. Include conservation in their brand promise. Yeah. Yeah. And then see how that can be seamlessly executed uh, consistently. I like how you bridge this very well for me onto my next question because it was literally <laughs> going to pick your brains around in our industry, especially in this region, Activations are huge. Yeah. Giveaways are huge. Yeah. Invitation to events are huge. And people expect that hospitality that we see that's so prevalent in the, in the region. This gives an alternative to all of that. Uh, and it's a fantastic alternative because you're doing something that's long-term preservation and conservationist. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not just saying, and I'm not trying to market uh, <laughs> uh, Sacred Groves here by saying, you know, 
the next giveaway you do, make sure it's sacred ghost. But I'm sure that <laughs> Vikram wouldn't mind me doing that. But these are the kind of things that you're saying is the eighth benefit or the next benefit. Yeah, it is because uh, you know I I think where I where I come from is that uh, one has to make uh, climate action sustainable. Mm. Yeah, and being a brand practitioner for decades on end, yeah, I firmly believe that you know conservation should be included in your brand promise and if possible it should be included in the purpose of your company as well so the moment you include that in the purpose statement of your company and make it a part of your culture then you find that it seamlessly extends not just into the activation intervention that you mentioned but in every aspect of what the company represents yeah so be it performance management for example you know um, many organizations now have uh, scorecards where ESG yeah. uh, is becoming an integral part of that. Yeah? So performance management is one. Uh, and in marketing, it is almost, uh, um, I would say, subliminally entering into uh, the mind space. So uh, just like plastic has entered into our life, right? So you'd be surprised that you are, you know, you, you didn't intend to and I didn't intend to as well, but I am wearing plastic, it's right? True. I, I just went out to buy a nice shirt and it just turned out to have buttons that were made out of plastic. So plastic has entered into our life very seamlessly without us even realizing it. The challenge and the opportunity for marketers is to make nature a part of that equation. Yeah, And I'd point you out to uh, TNFD yeah. uh, guidelines that, that are coming up shortly, I think in the month of September or October. Yeah. They release a detailed report where what... Uh, many organizations, investors and rating agencies are almost insisting is that make nature a part of your business story. Almost give nature a position on your board. Yeah, Give it a voice. And a voice. Yeah. So I saw you smiling when I said make nature a part of your board. Patagonia has already done that mm. as yeah. an example, as a precedent. Yeah. yeah. So when you make nature uh, a key stakeholder in your business uh, agenda, then a lot of these hundreds and thousands of actions get delivered seamlessly by people yeah. uh, at scale. And it's quite fun, you see, because like, maybe 10 years ago, we were fighting to get marketing onto the board, <laughs> you know, or getting a voice onto, onto the executive tables, right? Um, but now it's gone so far as our responsibility as marketeers, potentially. Indeed. Or the new you know, job titles that are being created today to give nature... But I would say it's not just nature, a voice on the board, but also we've got to look at the whole piece, which is yeah. the the social impact you're having and also clear governance, as you mentioned yes. about transparency earlier. Yeah. So whilst yours is very focused around nature and conservation, the whole piece has to come together for us to be able to make a difference in this year. Yeah, yeah. I'm obviously more biased towards nature. Um, and the reason I say that is that... Uh, you know, uh, climate change is pretty much here on us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we don't really have a choice in the matter. Mm, we are at 1.2 degrees above the baseline uh, at the moment when it comes to global uh, temperatures. Uh, there was a recent study that got widely published where in the next five years, um, uh, we will definitely hit 1.5 degrees. So we are seeing the impact of 1.2 degrees. So yeah. I was with some people uh, two days back who are from Canada. Yeah, And I mentioned to them that uh, Canada, since the beginning of the year, has lost almost 6 million hectares wow. of forests to forest fires. Now, to put that in context, it is bigger than the size of Switzerland Ooh. to forest fire in Canada alone. So I can go on and on about this. But the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, uh, when you look at us as um, corporations, we need to figure out a way to develop a method to give economic value to nature. So so today, for example, this glass of water, if it's uh, water flowing in a stream full of fishes, uh, there is no value to it. Only derived value. Yeah. 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 Uh, but if you package it and put it in a beautiful bottle and serve it here, yeah. then there is value. value. Yeah. So economic value requires a redefinition. And that's a big challenge for marketeers, isn't that is it? a huge challenge. I can't let you go without <laughs> asking you about looking ahead. What yeah. are, Having come out of Cannes, met the creme of the industry out there, um, what are you looking forward to in COP28? 
Well, what I'm looking forward to is um, number one, a greater level of awareness around the fact that we all need to uh, take steps towards climate action. Yeah, that's one. And a greater level of awareness in the larger civil society as well. Yeah. Uh, second, I want to see more and more examples and genuine examples of climate action yeah. that big and small companies and countries uh, commit to mm -hmm. and deliver successfully. Yeah. And third is um, hopefully um, inspire a few million climate action influencers. <laughs> hmm? Not just people like you and me who are on the <laughs> podcast today, but uh, you know your everyday folks on the street who recognize the fact that it is our responsibility um, to do whatever we can. And I refer to that as, um, actually, it's a brilliant study which you should read about. It's called Intergenerational Equity. Okay. So um, it is, in a sense, the responsibility of every generation uh, yeah. to leave behind a better place for the next. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say that just thinking about it and asking yourself that what can I make better yeah. uh, is a step in the right direction. Yeah. And I hope that COP28 gets a lot of us to think that way as well. Hopefully, looking forward to being there and participating. And, and I've asked this to all my guests and our guests of this podcast, but what are your top three? And I think you've hit them today anyway, but if you could summarize them, top three practical advices for marketeers today. I think first is uh, become a climate action influencer. Mm, the biggest responsibility and the tools that we have is um, aspiration and hope that we can communicate to the larger civic society, our yeah. consumer groups, and as all our stakeholders. Yeah. So marketers are uniquely positioned to do that. Yeah, that's one. Second is make it genuine. Please, no more campaigns. <laughs> <laughs> no more greenwashing. <laughs> deliver, uh, deliver impact at scale, and then communicate that later. Yeah. But this is a long, hard road. Yeah. Okay. So it's take those thousand steps. Yeah. Show success and then talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think third would be uh, influence public culture and influence popular culture. Uh, of course, um, guiding towards your personal um, commercial agenda for the co for the company that you represent. Yeah. Uh, but also uh, influence the world to be in a slightly better place um, by inspiration, uh, creativity and uh, sparks of magic. Vikram, thank you so much for your time today. I'm going to leave by just saying <laughs> we've got a seasoned marketeer telling us no more campaigns, which is absolutely brilliant <laughs> <laughs> for, a, for a Marketing Society podcast. But please do continue this conversation online. You, and let us know what you think and of the topics we've had and any comments you have for, for Vikram and I. Uh, join us next time for the next episode. Vikram, thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you very much. The Marketing Society Sustainability Squad podcast, leading the conversation on ESG.